and I'm just going to hit record here just so everybody knows. Um, yeah, we're here from MCC local international experts, as well as other local educators to discuss rotating topics around social issues, peace and justice. These webinars were incited in the hopes of building relationships, facilitating a space for learning and hopefully inspiring conversation beyond into all of your respective contexts. So thank you for being here. Um, we're so happy to have you join us and I implore you wherever you're tuning in from to engage with us together as we discuss fast fashion, sustainability, and the life cycle of clothing. My name is Gemma Bridgefoot and I will be facilitating our time together this morning. Um, but before we get started, I wanted to encourage you all to subscribe to our committee, committee newsletter. Um, if you wanna stay up to date with upcoming webinar events and details, as well as be a part of our community that seeks to engage with peace and justice through practical opportunities to learn, serve, pray, and advocate in our community and around the world. Um, before we go further, I wanted to go over some housekeeping info so that we can support you properly throughout the session. Um, so if you feel comfortable, um, I would encourage you to keep your video on so we can get acquainted with all of your lovely faces. Um, please keep yourself on mute throughout the presentation. And if you are having any technical issues, um, you can privately message Katie, who's, her name is Katie IT. Um, you can message her in the chat box and she will be able to help. Um, as the speakers share, I would encourage you to write your questions in the chat box um, as they come to mind so that we can move into the Q&A time after we hear from our speakers. Um, and before I introduce the speakers, I would like to acknowledge with respect that we are on the unceded traditional ancestral land of the Coast Salish peoples, and specifically Matsqui and Sumas First Nations, who are members of the Stolo Nation. The Stolo people are the people of the river, and they have lived in the Fraser Valley for more than 10,000 years. We are grateful to God, our creator, who placed us here to share this land, to work towards respectful relationships and peace, and to be good stewards of the land, which sustains us and gives us life. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce our speakers. So first we'll be hearing from Ben Svela, who graduated from UFV with a Bachelor in Business Administration and Economics minor. Prior to MCC, Ben worked as a buyer for Best Buy and managed a Target store when they opened in Canada. He enjoys engaging in physical activities in the outdoors year round, as well as playing board games with friends and family. Ben and his wife currently reside in Chilliwack, BC. Following Ben, we'll hear from Dr. Stefania Pizzaroni as well, and she has um, she also has a strong interest in sustainability and has pursued degrees related to environmental conservation and life cycle management. With a predominant focus on forestry, she has lived and worked in several countries, Italy, Wales, Scotland, New Zealand, and since 2016, Canada. She has also had the honor of working with and for Indigenous communities for the past nine years. Her current role as an assistant professor at the her current role as an assistant professor at the University of the Fraser Valley is dedicated to helping students develop a passion for environmental issues and strategies. Um, so, in order to optimize our Q and A time at the end, um, we'll hear from speakers back to back. Um, so, without um, more introduction, um, Ben, if you're ready to go. Awesome. Thank you, Gemma, and thank you everyone for joining us today and for your interest in this topic. And so I'm going to try to stick to my notes so I stay on time. And I uh, just want to first start with a bit of an overview of our MCC thrift stores and donation receiving and how that ties into clothing. And so we have, um, we try to seek a ratio of about 90% or higher of volunteers to staff. And so they do a lot of the work for us. Um, and so we're very fortunate that we have this dedicated group who are very much about wanting to get the most use out of product. Um, many of them come from backgrounds where they didn't have much and so they don't want to just easily throw something away or put it to waste. Um, so there's a lot of things that we do behind the scenes to extend the life of the product. And so some of the things that are not related to clothing would be cleaning and fixing re and repairing items. And so big example of this would be bikes. Um, sometimes we get a bike that we can't necessarily um, fix but we'll take parts from it and put it into another bike. Uh, we do metal recycling. We have a woodwork and upholstery shop to, to refinish and fix items. And we even run mattresses through a heat chamber in one of our locations as well. So it takes a, a large team to kind of get all of this stuff. And so at times, if you've donated at thrift shops, not just ours, you'll see that sometimes donation receiving is closed. Um, and that's just because we're overwhelmed with an abundance of product. And quite often that product is clothing. Um, 
and so it's it's fortunate for us that we receive a lot of clothing because it is our number one sales driver in our thrift shops too. It's something that people can shop often. It's affordable. Um, it's something that we can switch out a lot of. And so a unique benefit of shopping thrift for clothing is the fact that you can find um, clothing items that aren't maybe necessarily in brand new stores right now. So um, it might be a fashion from a year ago or from many years ago. And so people really appreciate that. Um, and so it helps extend the life of some of those items through that means of thrift because of that reason specifically. However, we still get this excess of clothing um, that we're unable to sell. And so um, we, we do a number of things with, with the clothing we get. And so if you have shopped in a thrift store like ours, you'll see there's a color rotation. And so um, generally product will rotate through the store three to four weeks. And then if it doesn't sell, um, it will get marked down to a certain price. And after that, we do remove it from the floor. Um, and so um, I just wanted to show you a quick video just to show you um, in one of our locations in Abbotsford, um, some of the processing of clothing so you can get an idea for just the sheer volume of it and what it takes um, to do that. So just give me one moment here. And it's okay if you can't fully hear the audio. And this is the clothing department, which is what you're probably most interested in. So, yeah, so these are the cages and what they look like when they're coming through. Um, and then they've got the great bins in the middle for the clothing that's not good enough. So, Tiffany, show you now every gum, everything, everything gets touched, everything gets assessed. And you can see why it's so labor intensive when you look at all of this and every single thing has to be handled, checked inside, you know, front, back. It's a lot. And you'll, so you can see how quickly they'll fill a bin. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. That's, that's the, the bin in the middle of the no good bin? That's the stuff that's, yeah, not good enough to sell. Wow. So All right, so that was Amy, our store manager of that location, just giving a quick run through of the clothing process at Center Thrift. And so the amount of clothing you see there would be typical of a day's worth of donations of clothing. So just think of this process every day of the week um, and, and even more than that at times. And so you see those big cages and it takes about an hour to an hour and a half to process that clothing because we touch every single item. And so um, she mentioned at the end a great bin. So when we're sorting through there's product we immediately identify we just can't sell right away. And so we put it into this recycling bin. Um, and I'll explain that where that goes a little bit later. But um, we check the clothing and then we put it on the floor and a lot of it sells, but some of it, it doesn't sell after uh, the four weeks either. And so what we're seeing is a lot more fast fashion type clothing, which is lower quality. Um, a lot of people buy it brand new because it's cheaper and they kind of use the mentality of a one use thing. And so I'm just gonna buy it for this occasion. Um, and so it's, it's a harder product to sell um, because it isn't the same kind of quality. And so it may not be in the same kind of shape as, a, as another item. And there's just so much of it. So when you have that much clothing, it gives people a lot of choice. And so even in a thrift store, it's, you might be surprised. It's, it's hard to sell all of that clothing. And so another thing uh, that is important to note with this is that um, clothing, when you think of it in the grand scheme of everything, is the second largest pollutant in the world, um, second to oil. And um, if you think of uh, the cotton for a t-shirt, takes about 2,700 liters of water. And then, and that's in addition to using insecticides, pesticides as well. So there is a significant um, impact to the environment that is going on with this. And it can take up to 200 years for clothing to decompose. And so knowing about this, what can we do? Because it, it's causing a significant um, challenge for us. And so, um, I think it's important to kind of look at what we can do collectively um, and corporately and also what we can do individually with this as well. And so I, I often use this term where um, when you donate to a thrift store, we don't have this magic wand and it makes your clothing all of a sudden um, be repurposed 100% or recycled. Um, so when we have some of that excess where they're putting it into those other bins, a lot of that we, we sell to a, a reseller. And so a lot of that goes internationally, which has a footprint economically as well, unfortunately. And we're not the only thrift chain that does that. Ideally, we would not want to be able to do that. Um, and then even then, we can't even um, sell everything to those means. We still have to put product through um, the landfill as well. 
And, and when you think of the fact that not even half of people donate all their clothing to a thrift shop, um, that's just immediately going to the landfill before it even comes to us. And then with some of the thrift stores having to put to the landfill, that's a lot of product that is going there. And so I've had a few different things that um, have come to mind as I, as I brainstorm these sorts of things. And so, you know, there could be, we have recycling tax um, for electronics. And so that could be a possible way to advocate for that um, so that we at the front end are aware this is how much it would cost to recycle or at least put money into finding different ways to use these fabrics. Um, also educating at the front end of the purchase how what the impact on the environment is, right? Some products are better than others. Um, and so a lot of it is just for us to know this. I mean, I've learned a lot in my last five, six years uh, working with MCC in this. Um, and how do we influence clothing companies and manufacturers to, to not use some of these practices that are um, so detrimental? And so it all comes down to demand, right? Uh, it's, it's business is very much, there's a demand, we're gonna seek to meet that demand. And so I think a lot of it's starting with our business leaders, um, educating them. They're very much about, you know, getting the, the most profit for the shareholder. And so if we could have a more holistic approach to that um, and seeing the social good and the environmental good as well. And so, um, you know, I did business school myself and just even training right in, in business school in that way, having that mentality, I think is a huge part. And I was encouraged to hear from actually one, from one of Stefania's peers, who's a business instructor at UFE as well, saying that he's seeing a lot of these entrepreneurial minded students are thinking about social good and environmental good. So the momentum is coming already. And then another big part of it is, so we can try to fix at the front end too, but we still have the impacts of what has been done already. And so um, we're kind of working with UFE and Stefania and her team as well to figure out, are there ways that we can break down these fibers? Because it's really hard when it's a multi-fiber product, it's not all the same. Can we do that in a way and then repurpose it um, for different things? Um, there's already companies like Patagonia out there who are been in this landscape for a long time. There's another company in Vancouver called Dbrand as well that is helping organizations in this way. And so we're looking at those types of solutions on the other end as well, just to have that full holistic approach. And then individually, there's things that we can do too. Um, and so we can try to repair clothing instead of just thinking, I'm gonna buy a new article of clothing or even um, repairing it before we donate it because um, we don't always have that manpower or labor or volunteer force that can do it at the store to fix and repair every item of clothing. And, and people can be selective because there's so much to choose from. Um, often those articles of clothing get disposed of as well. And we can just aim, think, aim to not purchase um, always, right? And just like, do I really need that item, right? Just having that, that second question before moving in that way. And so actually MCC in Canada and the US has just launched a new campaign this week um, about shop thrift first. Um, and, and people can sign this pledge that they're gonna seek to do that. Um, and is there a way of helping the environment in that way? And, and I think they'll be sending a link. Oh, Katie just sent that right now as well. And so um, if you sign this pledge, you get opportunity to sign for get gift cards too. Uh, we do draws for that and, and other uh, contests over the next couple of months, as well as the fact that um, you're just gonna get a little bit more education on, on the impacts of the industry. And so um, thank you for giving me the opportunity to share and I'm just gonna pass it over to Stefania. Thanks, Ben. Yeah, it's an excellent summary of everything that you do. It's incredible. Uh, the amount of collaboration that we've uh, achieved over the past few months. But um, but yeah, it's a pleasure to be here. It's a real honor. I myself am, am speaking to you from Kwantlen and Nooksack territories as a grateful guest. Um, I have been delving into this fashion and the fast fashion space recently because I just developed a course on it called Sustainable Fashion at the University of the Fraser Valley. And fashion is just incredible. I don't consider myself a fashionable person really, but it is uh, so interdisciplinary. It relates to anthropology, to economics, to sociology, philosophy, psychology, history, culture, and of course, to the environment. It is a method of how we express ourselves, how we communicate who we are, what we stand for. Activism can be a form of, uh, of how fashion is communicated. Fashion can transform politics. It can transform markets and industries. It is very dynamic, just like any other form of communication, and it is variable across time and place. 
it is a way for cultural expression, therefore, but as we'll see in a few minutes, it is also a form of cultural oppression in many places of the world as well. So I consider, you know, myself, again, not too fashionable, but it's something that I've started to reflect upon. You know, how do I feel when I buy clothing? And how do I feel when I wear fashion or clothing? And I invite you to think about that. How do you feel when you purchase things, especially clothes? And, and what does it make you feel when you wear them? Because this is part of how fashion has transformed from just, uh, you know, a, a method of wearing clothes to this huge industry uh, of fast fashion. Traditionally, though, you might remember, you know, fashion used to be really just two cycles a year, really in the spring and in the fall, preparing for changes of, of seasons. But now we see fashion has just become explosive. It's every week, 52 cycles a year is what fast fashion is considered. And there are many retailers like Zara, H&M, who release new lines of clothing every single week. We also have something called ultra fast fashion, which is new lines of clothing every couple of days. And Boohoo in the UK is one of those ultra fast fashion. So it's even worse uh, than fast fashion. And there's also fast luxury. You might think that the luxury market is, uh, is a not a part of it, but fashion retailers like Louis Vuitton also release new lines of clothing and new things every couple of weeks. So this has really driven this huge, you know, explosive expansion of the fashion industry and social media has been a real big part of this. Influencers in particular doing those big clothing hauls, showcasing, you know, what they've achieved that day, getting tens and twenties and even hundreds of items for, for very little money. Um, and we can access, we can purchase these items at any second of the day, just using our phones and a few presses of, of the phone, we can purchase something. And we see this now with, with our statistics. In the year 2000, the fashion industry produced 50 billion items. And remember, we're not even at 8 billion people on the planet. 50 billion items in the year 2000. And by 2015, that doubled to over 100 billion individual items of clothing in 15 years. Meanwhile, we see that clothing, clothing utilization, so this is the, the, the number of times we wear a particular item before we discard it that clothing utilization rate has just plummeted over that time as well. So basically we are buying more, but we're wearing it less before we start to discard it. And this has also transformed the garment manufacturing industry. So we see that the garment sector is now the, the world's third biggest manufacturing sector behind automotive and technology industries. Predominantly, the sector is, is uh, with women and girls. Women and girls work in the sector around the world. And this is unfortunately where we see the most human rights violations. Therefore, the garment sector in particular, but the fashion industry as a whole is actually a huge feminist issue. To share some slides here with you, just because I think this also expresses quite a lot of the impacts a little better than I can articulate. But the real challenge here in the fashion industry is actually this idea that we are taking we are making and we are wasting. It's a very linear life cycle approach. It doesn't really bring too much back to the center in a circular method. 97% of the fibers that we use in our clothing, 97 is actually brand new. It's virgin feedstock. A lot of that, as you can see, comes from plastic. Maybe you don't realize, but uh, plastic actually makes up the majority of your clothing fibers, polyester being one of the dominant ones. And plastic is derived from oil. Cotton makes up another 26%, but cotton, although it feels like a sustainable, it's a, you know, it's a plant, it feels wholesome. It actually, as Ben says, uses significant amounts of water and typically quite a lot of chemicals. Other feedstock as well, like wool and semi-synthetic fibers, but 97% is brand new, meaning again, that we are drilling, we are harvesting, and we are producing uh, you know, as much as we can every single year to create this 53 million tons each year just for clothing. And you can see that this manufacturing sector is huge, but actually we lose 12% of it just because of off cuts and wastage during the processing of sewing and stitching. A lot of material is, is produced here, but a lot of it is lost. And we do use it, of course. And sometimes we donate it to MCC and it gets donated you know, and cycled again, but eventually you know, that gets uh, landfilled or incinerated. And as we use the item, we wash it. And even during that process, there is a lot of damage. So each time we wash an item, it sheds fibers. And as you can remember, many of those fibers are plastic. So a lot of those microfibers are going out into our waterways. And eventually, as I said, yes, it does get landfilled or incinerated. This is approximately actually, you know, one garbage truck full of clothes, landfilled or incinerated across the world every single second. One second 
you know, every, you know, every second, one garbage truck. Very little makes it back. So this is an area that we are seeing uh, some improvement in, this recycling component, but this is basically very minimal at, at the, it's just cheaper right now. It's cheaper to get virgin feedstock than it is to recycle. So the, um, the challenge therefore is, you know, just this transparency aspect. I mean, do we realize how much energy and water and chemicals, all of this input, do we realize how much input goes into our clothes? Um, you know, so one kilogram of cotton, it, basically a shirt and a pair of jeans can take up to 20,000 liters of water. And there is a limit to how much, uh, you know, water is out there, right? Fresh water in particular, because cotton requires fresh water. This is an example of the damage. The Aral Sea in Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan, uh, we see that this is the Aral Sea was the fourth largest lake in the world in 1970. But over time, due to cotton production, the lake has disappeared. 90% of it is now gone. And that is overwhelmingly due just to the cotton production sector in this area. Unfortunately, as I mentioned before, uh, and quite shockingly, there are a number of human rights violations across uh, the value chain, the supply chain of fashion, in particular fiber creation, but also the garment manufacturing. Forced labor, low wage, oh, I mean, really low wage labor, you know, $10 a month kind of labor, right? Uh, low wage, forced labor, but also um, unsafe labor. In 2013, you might remember that the Rana Plaza in Bangladesh collapsed, killing hundreds of women, predominantly women and girls. This is of major concern. And just, again, making that connection to your clothes, it is very likely that someone or multiple people suffered to make your clothes. When we have our clothes in our possession, and again, when we wash them, there are impacts even to that. It is estimated up to 35% of all the microplastics in the marine environment are just because we're washing our synthetic fibers, our plastics, polyesters. That gets shedded into the environment and really huge amounts, 700,000 fibers each time you wash your clothes. And unfortunately, our water treatment plants aren't really mandated to capture these microfibers. As Ben mentioned, yes, a lot of clothing does get exported. Once you uh, deliver it to the thrift store and the thrift store tries to sell it, but they can't, they do export these, these items, MCC, but everyone. And uh, oh, through my research, I haven't really seen many positive impacts. Of course, there is uh, some utilization of the clothes, but overwhelmingly the countries do view these items as garbage. And it has also displaced textile markets in many countries. So countries have their own textile markets, like in Kenya. Uh, many years ago, it used to be half a million workers in this garment industry. Now, only 20,000 actually are able to have jobs. In Ghana, jobs have uh, in textiles have plunged 80% over recent decades because of this exportation, basically our exportation of garbage. So we do have a low price for clothing, but at what price? Because, you know, I think there is something to acknowledge here that low priced clothing is uh, a game changer, especially for low income families. So I do want to acknowledge that this is um, this is important for low-income families to be able to purchase new items it does bring a sense of dignity along with it, but it does come at a cost. And an economist once said that this is your consolation prize. Low-priced clothing is your consolation prize because healthcare costs more, education costs more, housing costs more, transport costs more, everything costs more. But now we are distracted because this is our consolation prize. But recognizing this consolation prize comes at a cost is really important because it's actually significant. 20% of all global wastewater is attributed to the fashion industry, 10% of greenhouse gas emissions. And that's just in the textile production alone. Textile production alone is 1.2 billion tons of CO2, more than flights and maritime shipping combined. And if you reflect on the full life cycle of the, of the fashion from, from material production to garment production, to retail, to consumer, and to end of life, that's actually over 3 billion tons of CO2 each year. It does look like it is growing, unfortunately. We see the fashion industry projecting uh, usage of 35% more land so to produce fiber like cotton. That's an extra 115 million hectares just to produce fiber that we can't eat that could have been agriculture or just left for biodiversity. And we see that by 2030, consumption could rise 63%. You know, estimates are suggesting that. And that 63%, what does it mean? It's actually around 500 billion additional t-shirts by 2030 alone. But don't despair, right? This isn't a whole entirely depressing presentation because there's lots of things to be mindful of and hopeful for. 
and there's a lot of movement here. You coming today is a really good sign. The idea that there are people that might watch this presentation afterwards is a really good sign. And so sustainable fashion is a strong movement. Uh, there's a lot of uh, resources out there that are developing, becoming more, more accessible. Uh, this is related to, you know, cotton trust, organic cotton, um, a lot of data that's being shared. There's movements for social justice and for waste minimization techniques. There's also a lot of movement in transparency and accountability, arguably some of the largest challenges right now in the current fashion industry. And finally, financial incentives as well. So there's a lot of movement here, and this is what's really exciting. And there's a lot of different um, aspects to consider, especially the secondhand revolution. And as Ben noted, uh, told you, this is really um, nothing to be uh, to ignore. This is actually projections that are indicating that the secondhand clothing market will uh, surpass the fast fashion market by 2028, upwards of $64 billion around the world. Again, surpassing fast fashion. Mind, mind you, it is kind of fueled, right? The fast fashion comes into the secondhand market. But uh, the idea that people are more open to buying used clothing is a game changer. And additionally, the other game changer is e-commerce, which is with your computer, but also m-commerce with your mobile phone, right? So the idea that you can use your phone at any point of any time of the day to purchase items. Uh, ThreadUp is one example. And I know that MCC is also starting to move into this kind of e-commerce, m-commerce space as well. COVID-19 actually has really fueled this. So we've seen uh, that clothing retailers, especially secondhand that are online, are uh, able to really significantly grow uh, compared to in-person, you know, in in-store, secondhand clothing. Really cool things though, just, just to kind of share with you, uh, zero waste is a major concept in the sustainable fashion space. There are 3D garment technologies where you know, a garment is literally sewn by a 3D printer. Uh, same for uh, shoes, right? So shoes are actually being, you can actually make these shoes like Nike, Adidas, Reebok. Uh, fabrics can also be dyed using waterless technology. This is huge because most of that wastewater is from the dyeing process. So waterless technologies are on the rise. On-demand production is also on the rise. The idea that you can order an item and it is only made once you order it. There's no more overstock. There's no more wastage. On-demand production. I don't have time to go into all of it, but just know that there are movements for fair uh, fashion industries. And I encourage you when you do look to buy items, uh, you know, that is your way of exchanging power. Your purchase is a form of power and you are exchanging it uh, with somebody else every time you buy something. So I encourage you to think about how to use your power appropriately and consider investigating your companies that you buy from. Uh, there are a number of collaborations and cooperatives now that are really emphasizing um, a, a more you know, human rights than ever before. Innovations are super exciting and some of my colleagues from my, uh, my, my department are here, like Mariano is looking at some innovation as well in this space. Uh, but something just I pulled out of nowhere because it's, I just spoke to me, biodegradable sequins. Have you thought about sequins? Probably not, but a garment like this can have tens of thousands of sequins and those are made from plastic. And often people dispose of them. They use this kind of garment for holidays or for a wedding and then they get rid of it. Uh, so we are really looking at um, you know, biodegrad biodegradable options. Regenerative agriculture also is a major you know, situation here that's changing. The idea that we can use fiber from plants that are use less fresh water and use less arable land. You know, again, we don't always have to use cotton. And fashion from waste, which I think is really fun because this is uh, an item here. It's called the gum shoe. Believe it or not, this is used, is, has used used chewing gum to create the sole of this shoe. There are companies here like Econo uh, that's using uh, carpets and fishing nets and ocean waste to, uh, to repurpose and recycle those plastics to form uh, regenerated nylon. Pinatex is using natural textiles waste from pineapple production. So it's using the leaves from pineapple production to make this leather-like material. Fish leather is another option. So fish uh, industry is huge. And each time for each ton of fish, there's 45 kilos of waste. So it's using that waste to create this, what looks like, you know, kind of like a leather, right? This definitely is convincing, but this is actually mushrooms. So kind of a, a leather-like uh, fabric from mushrooms, but you can also use it like as fiber as well. Evernew is a, is a really interesting circular designed uh, product company that's using discarded clothing, breaking it down to a cellular level and then reformatting it and, and uh, reforming it into new fibers. So this is a really interesting one because uh, as Ben said, it's really usually hard to recycle clothing. 
People Tree, a really great company, right? And I've, I've investigated quite a few, but People Tree uh, definitely is putting a lot of effort into fair trade producers, uh, garment workers, and is making this kind of transparency, as you see here, super easy to get to. So you know who made your clothing at each step. And so they're really uh, focusing on this who made my clothes kind of hashtag. And that speaks to this idea that we can design for empathy. We can engage in the sector with empathy. And we should, because we should have more relationship to our clothes. Currently, I think we can all look in our closets and, and have 98% of the clothing we don't have an attachment to. And that is really why we are able to waste it, to throw it away, to discard it without a second thought, because we don't have that relationship. But if we can develop more of that relationship, maybe we can realize that there are emotional and narrative cues, like who made the clothing and where was it made? And is it designed for me? Did somebody make it specifically for me? Is it transformative and adaptable to who I am and to my needs? Because these are aspects that will uh, increase your attachment and increase your ability to care for that item. Clothing is a story. You are part of that story. It is not just an object. It is a full, rich story that does have a lot of impacts, but that can be minimized if there is more care placed at your at your particular level. Ultimately, though, you know, we are in this position where the best option is not to buy it. And then uh, if you can, you know, if you need to buy something, choose it well and make it last. And to, to just end on a quick, I know I'm probably over time, but uh, to end on a quick um, uh, quote I wanted to share with you from uh, Robin Wall Kimmerer, who is an Anishinaabe plant ecologist, writer and professor uh, so Robin Wall Kimmerer, I do encourage you to read her works, but she makes this really amazing quote that I'll read to you now. It's very applicable to this, uh, to this topic. She writes, uh, to name the world as a gift is to feel one's membership in the web of reciprocity. It makes you happy and it makes you accountable. Conceiving of something as a gift changes your relationship to it in a profound way. And even though the physical makeup of the thing has not changed, a woolly knit hat that you purchase at the store will keep you warm regardless of its origin, but if it is hand knit by your favorite auntie, then you are in relationship to that thing in a very different way. You are responsible for it, and your gratitude has motive force in the world. You're likely to take much better care of that gift, than, gift hat than that commodity hat because it is knit of relationships. This is the power of gift thinking. I imagine if we acknowledge that everything we consume is the gift of Mother Earth, we would take care, better care of what we are given. Mistreating a gift has emotional and ethical gravity as well as ecological resonance. Thank you. Wow, thank you both so much for your insightful presentations. Um, those are both loaded with so much interesting information and um, yeah from the back end of what goes on at MCC thrift to unpacking the materials of clothing I I had no idea that you could make uh, leather out of mushrooms that is so cool to me <laughs> um, yeah and then also learning about the impact of the production has on the environment um, and people and so we know from just from hearing from both of you that this the the issue of fast fashion is both environmental but also extremely humanitarian as well. Um, so we are going to transition now into um, Q&A period. So if there's anything that sticks out to you guys um, or if you have follow-up questions, please post them in the chat box. Um, so just to get us started here, um, I know, um, Stefani, I think you kind of touched a little bit about kind of what's been going on since COVID. Um, but I just wanted to, um, yeah, I'm wondering kind of like since the pandemic, like how has, how has things like supply chains or consumer behavior um, kind of changed, I guess, since, since COVID? What are the impacts been? Um, and Ben, you can speak to this maybe too. What are the impacts been on thrift? Um, but yeah, I don't know if either of you guys. Yeah, it's a good, good question. I think, uh, and Ben, I think can also answer this. It seems like there's a few different dimensions, but uh, certainly purchasing of new items has has dropped significantly, except for uh, like waste up items. You know, so everyone online at work, you know, so the, the work tops have sold, the work bottoms have plummeted. You know, there's no purchasing of that. Um, 
but new items uh, purchases have plummeted. And so the, pro the projections are really stark for this upcoming year about uh, how the fashion industry is going to cope with that. And unfortunately, that does impact uh, produced garment manufacturers the most because that's their livelihood. Uh, and so it's nothing that can be remedied very, very quickly. So new, new purchases have uh, decreased, but online purchases, as you can imagine, have soared. So there are still a number of people buying online uh, new items. As I mentioned, there's a lot of people buying online for secondhand items. That's also quite interesting. Um, and I think Ben has noted a pretty sharp uptick in donations <laughs> during COVID. Yeah, no, just to speak on that, we've always been heavy on donations and that hasn't changed during COVID. And uh, the interesting thing is, as people go buy more online, specifically clothing, you can't try it on, right? So you order something online and not everyone will return it to the online reseller. So Thrift benefits from getting brand new articles of clothing um, donated to the stores that were purchased online in that sense. Um, and so, yeah, and people just through the pandemic have been purging their closets to purging their homes. They got all this time. And so donations are, are definitely not lacking for us. It is still a feel good item though. I mean, I think that's, that's what, how the fast fashion industry has risen is because it's cheap and it makes us feel good for a moment. Uh, purchasing it, it releases endorphins, and then uh, the idea that you're wearing the latest trend also releases those same endorphins. You feel part of a community. And some companies, like I mentioned, Boohoo, are exclusively online. Uh, and so they are very mobile in this current space right now and COVID-19. So they have been very quick to transition to leisure wear and to, you know, sweatpants and to other items very quick versus like H&M and Zara that are more kind of brick and mortar. So these companies, uh, the ultra fast fashion ones, and mind you, are are doing pretty well. Uh, so it's really, um, you know, something to think about in terms of how that will shape into the future. Will it continue? It's possible. And kind of along, along with that, I'm kind of curious too to know, um, I know that you also kind of touched on this as well, but um, so much has changed in our society, I think, since this, um, since like social media has taken a, a larger presence in workplace, in our social lives, like everything. Um, so I don't know if either of you guys can speak to how has social media impacted um, fast fashion, buying habits, the, the environment, like has there been, I don't know, spikes in like in forest degradation or those sort of things or I, I think, it, yeah, like I mentioned, social media has definitely been a contributor to fast fashion over the years. You know, it's accessible, it's an inescapable. And especially for young people, it is, um, it's kind of, you're, you can't escape it. This is who you are. If you're not on social media, you don't, almost don't exist. And so if you're on social media, you are seeing this, you are bombarded with these images and you are made to feel less than in many ways, uh, if you are not a part of this movement, whatever the movement might be. Um, and so it has been a real uh, contributor to, to the fast fashion industry. Um, it can be the same for the opposite, right? We can see that this can be used as a force for good. And we're seeing that as well, where a lot of influencers now are, are starting to, to use their power for good as it were. Mm -hmm. um, and I know that, that the MCC is also looking strongly at social media and, uh, and how like Instagram can be used to kind of share their, uh, their I clothing items in the store and such. So it's, it is, it's a real strong space to watch. Mariano had a question. So Mariano and I work together and he's actually, um, he's working on decomposing some of your clothing. I don't know if you know this, but I brought some of the clothing from MCC to Mariano uh, uh, so he can use um, some techniques with mushrooms. Yeah, to, he's got some of his lab work at home right now. So he's, he's testing different types of fibers and materials and how they are uh, the rates of decomposition uh, with mushrooms, right? So this is one of the avenues that we're thinking of um, in terms of a UFV MCC collaboration. All right, so I just have to, um, I have to click ask to unmute. So I think Mariano, there might be something that will come up on your screen um, for you to unmute if you wanna ask a question. <laughs> I don't know if you see it. Maybe, <laughs> there he okay. is. So can you hear me? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay, so yeah, Steve, uh, we were talking with Stefania about the about her course and I suggested we can start something and yeah I've been trying to I've been trying to wrap around my mind on how the uh, garment that can no longer be resold that can no longer be that is going to the um, to the landfill 
can still be used. And I know there's a lot of energy that went into that clothing. And that's why when Stefania mentioned about this industry that will, um, uh, that will try to um, just like, uh, um, bring, 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 bring those clothes into fiber. I said, well, you're, we're lo losing that energy that went into putting it in together. So I said, what if we can do something about it instead of going to the landfill? I'm not talking about the other stuff that can be used. Those are other industries. But for me, it's about the uh, decomposition. And so I was, uh, I, will, I will tell you my suggestions later on. But before I forget, I would like to just um, mention about what uh, Stefania mentioned about relationship to the clothing. And as Filipinos, and I, I know that in Asian countries too, we are so attached to our clothing, you know, the colors, everything. And if it so happened that it was created or uh, made by our uncle or aunt, then the more. I still have if I still have clothes from the Philippines since I was young, and it's still with me. <laughs> so, <laughs> why are you holding on to it? Because it's special. And this is what I was, uh, I would like to probably suggest or comment to Ben or to, to Stefania. If you, uh, I'll tell a story first. I have a, I have a, a friend who, whose partner uh, passed away. And so he has a lot of clothing. So what will you do with that clothing? Okay, so the, my friend is so attached to the clothing that he doesn't like to give it away. Okay, so, but I said, it has to, you have to do something about it. And, but he doesn't know how. And I, one time he wanted us to buy clothing for the dog. They have a dog and you know, I do not know what clothing. They said, said why are you buying? I said, why don't you use those clothes that, you know, into those, into a pet? And she said, well, that's good, but I do not know how to sew, right? I have, a, I have also a friend, another friend who is a tailor. So now they created this, right? And everybody, when we go to the mall, said, what, you know, because it's a t-shirt, but it was created properly as, as a dog attire or whatever, right? And this is what I was thinking. If in the, during the COVID, did MCC advertise their, their, um, their materials for people who, there were, there, there's a lot of um, people who went into sewing. I myself went into sewing one time. I said, okay, because I have nothing to do. So I said, okay, let me have, and if you tell them, instead of buying new textile for all your projects, why don't you come to MCC and find something that you can use, right? Just like how my friend, what my friend did. And I mm -hmm. think that is one way of probably um, I reusing. I think it is, yeah, I, th I think it is, Mariana. I think it's the idea that uh, we're looking at uh, we're looking at clothing like waste. It's a waste product, but actually we, we need to transform our mindset that uh, waste can actually be a resource. And, yeah. um, and I don't know if, how many people know, it shocked me, I didn't know this, but uh, our waste in Abbotsford, our garbage is exported to the border of Washington and Oregon. So there's no more landfill space in <laughs> Abbotsford. So Mission and other, you know, they have other options, but Abbotsford, the garbage is exported. Uh, so, so when we're throwing away our clothing, imagine that it's going that distance. Um, so yeah, my idea is uh, for now, I'm making this small pots. These are pots uh, of clothing, yeah. or clothing from MCC. So clothing yeah. from MCC and I uh, inoculated them with some mushrooms that will at least start destroying the fabric. And you can still use the pot for your flower pot, etc. And all of and when it's it's gone, then it's also uh, partly decomposed. So that is that's my project. I'm I'm having issues with some of the textiles that <laughs> that Stefania gave me. Um, I think there was one that was wool. Wool is a difficult 
although it is organic, right? Yeah. It is made just like your hair. So yeah. <laughs> it's it's interesting. Uh, a lot it's of not, interesting. Uh, yeah, we're, this is going to be a long term endeavor, I think. Ben, yeah, it's, so it's not really we're excited. a problem, but we're excited we have for to find solutions. And yeah. I'm also into plastic because, as Stefania mentioned, yeah. there's a lot of plastic in our clothes. There is a fungi that can eat plastic, but Mm. That is from the Amazon, so I do not have oh, right. I do not have um, the um, probably uh, funds yet to probably mm -hmm. uh, ask for the uh, for this um, uh, fungi uh, right. species. So probably in the future, but it could happen. Yeah, but I'm trying my best to oh. see what can be done with the with the textiles that Stefania has given me. Thank you, Mariano. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Mariana. That was good to hear a little bit more about what's, what's going on in the community with repurposing and using different materials. Um, I just wanted to, um, uh, Catherine, you said that you have a comment. I wonder if we can have a bit more, a couple more minutes here. So I can hear what you have to say. I'm just asking you to unmute so you might see something pop up for you. There we go. Oh, thank you. So, um, Stefania, especially your presentation was so interesting to me. Um, my discipline was anthropology and I retired about a year and a half ago. Um, I both taught and I um, led students in international programming from the University of Calgary. Um, about 35 years ago or so, my mother uh, worked in a sheltered workshop. And um, they uh, took uh, recycled clothing and made it into quilts. And so even way back then, 35 years ago, there was already a lot of clothing that was being dumped. When I went to do my graduate uh, studies, I did my research in Cuba um, in around the year 2000. And if you know anything of the history of Cuba, the, the 90s were a complete evaporation of their economy because the Russians had withdrawn. And so the uh, very uh, little was getting into Cuba only for the most part, um, very expensive fabrics, very few clothes, um, and, and a secondhand market started. And it was really how Cubans were clothing themselves for quite a while was through the secondhand clothing that was coming in from outside of the country, more often than not um, from people like me donating it and then and then it making its way into this uh, secondhand clothing markets. Um, later though, I and so I saw that as a good opportunity, but later I was had a chance to travel, um, particularly in Ghana where uh, secondhand clothing was in the markets. And so you would see this competition between much, I, I felt like much like India and plastics versus clay uh, pots, uh, uh, eating utensils, there was this competition between these beautiful fabrics that were made in, in uh, uh, West Africa um, that were ready to go to dressmakers and that sort of thing versus these recycled clothes. And I could see that um, just from casual observation without any research at all, there was a, a huge impact on uh, dressmakers and, and, you know, the ones who were dyeing the cloth and, and all of those kinds of things. And it wasn't for the good. Um, I was very surprised to learn about this concept of fast fashion. I have always been attached to my clothes. I love, I go and I buy them, I buy them for comfort. I buy, I bought this one because it's so large and I can wrap myself up in it and, and be cozy. And and this ideology behind disposable or, or clothing that we can move through quickly. And I wonder if, you know, we talk about it sort of as the end, like what are we gonna do at the end product? But what is it that we're gonna do in the beginning to stop uh, people from doing this. I mean, this is, you know, uh, we have these opportunities, for example, in curriculum and primary schools to get our, our kids thinking differently. Also, uh, fakes and replicas. I mean, that's a another huge issue. Like, I, I can't afford the Chanel purse, but I can buy the fake Chanel purse um, or the fake Chanel clothing. And so I find that for me, anthropologically, I always think like, where is it that we can go back let's, let's backtrack this um 
uh, to a point where we can slow things down. Anyway, the other one I thought about was furniture because, again, large amounts of fabric and stuffing and all of those kinds of things, wood, um, and, and people will also treat furniture as very disposable. So that's all I had my comments. Thank you for your time and thank you for your presentations. It was wonderful. Thank you. Yeah. No, Catherine, you raised some good points. I mean, the, the idea that we don't have relationships to furniture, clothing, all that makes a huge impact as we can yeah. see. And, and you know, the, the real change starts with, I mean, unfortunately, it is human behavior. So it starts yeah. with us as consumers and there would be no fast fashion if there wasn't demand. So it is about changing our demand and what we are demanding. So 80%, um, roughly 80% of the decisions related to clothing is at the designer level. So the designer uh, yep. is also a, a major power holder in the whole yep. sphere of fashion. So they decide the materials and how to, you know, how to make the cuts and how it's sewn together, what yep. types of durability it's likely to have. And uh, yep. it's really um, a, a major consequence of fast fashion is that uh, it's so fast that the designers don't have real time to actually test their items. And yep. so that's why, you know, when it comes to the MCC, it's, you know, zippers are falling off or buttons are missing. Yep because there's no durability testing as there used to be. And so we are producing items so quickly that it's just a guess uh, as to its durability. But um, designers have a huge power because they can choose recycled fibers or they can choose more sustainable fibers. Uh, but that demand has to be there as well. So they have to be responsive to the customer. And unfortunately that's us, right? So we as, again, consumers do have this power transaction in our hands each time we, we make a purchase. Exactly. Um, so a lot of it, a lot of the power is us. Um, legally, there are a lot of policies though that can be in, in place. And uh, places like Sweden, for example, I've put in a position here where you can charge the producer. So it's an extended producer responsibility, EPR. The producer producer deals with it. So once it gets to the end, the producer is responsible for uh, managing the waste and dealing and paying for that. Uh, so EPR is a, is a major policy. Um, I think Ben mentioned the idea that we should put a little tax on it. It's interesting that the yeah. UK proposed that a few years ago, one penny, one penny per item, and it okay. didn't pass. No. Uh, yeah. So it was the idea that one penny per item could be put on their new clothes and they would generate literally tens of millions of dollars because of the quantity. I'm reminding you. It didn't pass. So one penny can make a difference and yet still policymakers are hesitant to tax anything uh, and so it's um so it's really a challenge here but uh, ultimately it's just demand that's the first step for sure uh, and making sure that you are using your power appropriately as consumers so each of us have that all right thank you so much for everyone engaging in uh, the q a and thinking critically um, just to, I guess, synthesize here, it sounds like there's there's so many levels of um, where we need collectively to cooperate together. We need businesses and corporations who are not thinking silo thinking and that there's only environmentalists and then there's businesses on the other hand, it needs to be very much, there needs to be a lot of overlap. Um, but then also us as consumers, um, I hear from both presentations that um, we have responsibility um, as consumers to either buy from or promote brands that like Patagonia that are doing their their fair share at um, being stewards of the environment, um, but also um, making their clothing ethically um, or repairing goods, repurposing goods, which we heard with the mushrooms and the cool things that are happening with all those uh, materials. Um, and then there's also the hard um truth of just buying less and i think that is the you know that's not the attractive answer but i think it really is in a lot of ways something that we have to challenge ourselves with um is just why are we buying goods what kinds of goods are we buying and just like do you actually need these things and um yeah so i just I want to say thank you to both uh, speakers. Um, it was just so interesting to hear from both of you. Um, thank you everyone for engaging. Um, and just to wrap this up, so our next uh, webinar will be taking place on May 13th um, and we're going to be hearing from our Indigenous Neighbors Coordinator. Um, so there'll be more details on the website um, on that to come, but that will be really interesting. Um, we'll also be sending everyone a follow-up email with a very short survey um, or uh, Katie I think she's going to be posting a um, feedback form in the chat um, it just takes one minute and that will help us improve our sessions so that we can serve you guys better um, so again thank you for tuning in and um, to our speakers for sharing um, with your sharing us with, with us your knowledge and expertise um, I hope you all have a great rest of your day and enjoy the sunshine so take care everyone thank you so much